Hi, this is Eric Cressy, and I've been working with Proteus Motion for the last few years to kind of develop a little bit of a protocol for both understanding how power impacts athletic performance and as an extension of that, how we can use Proteus to assess and train those power capabilities. One of the outcomes of this interaction um, with a, an up and coming company that's really looking at things in a unique way is that we've developed a unique uh, Proteus power test, which um, is something that we've tested in the trenches with a lot of our professional college and high school athletes to build out some substantial sizes. And I think it's important that we, we give you the background that you need in order to be successful with these tests. So we're going to make sense of the Cressy slash Proteus performance test. But first, I think it's really important that we understand how we develop power um, and also the difference between power and acceleration, strength and power, all these things, how they relate together. And this is a great review from Robert Newton's group. It's called Developing Maximal Neuromuscular Power Part 2, Training Considerations for Improving Maximal Power Production. It's from 2011, but all of the key points are still incredibly applicable a decade later. This is available, free full text online, so definitely check it out. But I want to go over four key elements to um, this landmark review. The first one is that a fundamental relationship exists between strength and power, which dictates that an individual cannot possess a high level of power without first being relatively strong, right? So, uh, you know, power is a, an interaction of force and time. So if you don't have force to produce, it doesn't matter how fast you're going to produce it. So we have athletes that, that can apply force quickly, but they don't have an absolute amount um, that makes them successful. And there's some good research on volleyball players that shows that you know you can't improve vertical jumps unless you know squats improve simultaneously you know in a, in a lesser trained population and then eventually we get to the point where we've got a good enough strength foundation that we can actually capitalize on on different points along that force velocity curve Second point is consideration of movement pattern, load, and velocity specificity is essential when designing power training programs. So this has a few different implications. The first thing is we recognize that throwing a shot put is going to be different than throwing a baseball, right? A five ounce implement is going to be a lot lighter than a shot put. So there may be different training implications for how we deal with baseball players versus shot putters. But probably more significantly here is the consideration of movement pattern um, component to this. And what we're really appreciating is that just because you're a really good sagittal plane power athlete doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to carry over well to producing force in the frontal and the transverse planes. So we see a lot of people with 38 inch vertical jumps who can't throw a baseball fast or are really unremarkable when it comes to rotational med ball stuff. And this is because they aren't necessarily proficient working in different planes of motion. So um, just like balance and proprioception are very skill specific, power development definitely is as well. So if you want to be a powerful rotational athlete, you have to train rotation. Third, it's vital to consider the individual athlete's window of adaptation for each neuromuscular factor contributing to maximal power production when developing an effective and efficient power training program. A training program that focuses on the least developed factor contributing to maximal power will prompt the greatest neuromuscular adaptations and therefore result in superior performance improvements for that individual. So we have absolute speed. That's running, jumping, change of direction, things at, at a lighter uh, you know, external load or no external external load, it might just be body weight. At the other spectrum, the absolute strength end of the continuum, that might be squatting or deadlifting really heavy. And then we fill in the cracks, maybe it's jump squats at 30% of, of one rep max as more of a speed strength. And then, you know, we shift a little bit towards the strength end of the continuum, it's Olympic lifts, which are more of a strength speed dynamic. So we have to figure out is where is the athlete deficient on this continuum. Typically, if they're very untrained, they're very naturally elastic, um, when they, you know, they don't have a huge background in weight training, we need to shift them all the way to the, the absolute strength end of the continuum so that they can eventually come back and benefit from all these different entities. Conversely, if we have a power lifter who's been lifting really heavy stuff for a long time, and we want to turn that power lifter into a, a high level athlete that has to run fast, jump high, change directions, we probably need to bring them over to the absolute speed end of the continuum, um, both to train those specific power qualities, but also to develop elasticity through the tendons, the fascial system, you name it. So train where people haven't been to get the best adaptation. And then 
Fourth, a key consideration for the long-term development of an athlete's power production capacity is the need for an integration of numerous power training techniques. This integration allows for variation within power mesocycles and microcycles while still maintaining specificity, which is theorized to lead to the greatest long-term improvement in maximal power. So in short, this is periodization, right? If we look at our competitive athletes, there are going to be times of year where they train more on certain portions of the continuum and times of the year when they train at other, time, uh, other ends of the continuum. So in the early off season, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time doing absolute speed stuff with our baseball players because they've done so much of that during the season. Their lowest hanging fruit is to go and attack the absolute strength side of things in that off season dynamic so that we can set the stage for having plenty of force so that we want to train strength speed and speed strength and absolute speed as the off season progresses. We're in a better position to have you know force impacting that equation. So these are four things you really have to consider. And what's key in the context of Proteus is it slides really well in on the absolute speed, speed strength, and strength speed sides of things, which traditionally have been really hard to train in rotational athletes, particularly because um, you know medicine balls, the line of pull goes up and down, and we want to apply force side to side. So it gives us more specificity, specificity with respect to movement pattern than we've previously been able to get in those middle grounds um, for rotational athletes. And this is a, a way to kind of just demonstrate some of these things we just talked about is that, you know, functional strength is the foundation for all of this. You need to have force to apply to create joint stability. Mobility is your ability to get into a position or posture that's heavily dependent on stability, um, you know, on top of the actual range of motion of the joints. You can't have power unless you have strength. And these four entities really create a scenario where you can develop the mechanics, whether it's hitting or throwing that's right for you. And then you can start to do more of the sexy stuff, the pitch design stuff where you manipulate the baseball a little bit differently, or you start talking about approaches for a hitter at the plate. And, and these are you know, certainly things that can be you know, discussed in different capacities across different sports. But this, this pyramid has to be built like this. You can't flip it upside down, which is what we often see with young athletes who want to attack you know, pitch design when in reality they can't do a body weight lunge or they don't have any element of rotational power. Um, it's kind of like going to calculus before you've taken algebra. It just doesn't work. So we talked about this a little bit earlier, but power is very plain specific. And this, this study came out from Graham Lehman back in 2013. And what was interesting about it is he actually found very little correlation between sagittal plane power initiatives and throwing velocity. So in other words, just having a good vertical jump didn't mean you could throw a baseball very fast. They found that lateral to medial jumps were consistently correlated with high throwing velocity. And they also found that a rotational med ball throw for distance was something that predicted velocity. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that our power training is plane specific in the context of our sport. And we look at this absolute speed to absolute strength continuum, as I alluded to earlier, at the far left you have things like sprinting in plyos if we were developing an elite sprinter, and then to the far right we have you know, more your conventional strength training exercises. Jump squats would be a, a speed strength exercise. Olympic lifts might be a strength speed exercise. So we have these options for, for kind of spanning this entire continuum. If we have an untrained college basketball player who's not, never done really anything except for play hoops, we're gonna go all the way over to the absolute strength end of the continuum. We're gonna get him a lot stronger. And before you know it, a year or two into his college career, he's benefiting from more Olympic lifts, more jump squats, just because we, we make it a priority to go to his lowest hanging fruit, his biggest window of adaptation. Now we take this and apply it to pitching all the way to the absolute speed end of the continuum is long toss, bullpens, flat ground drills, these, these things that take place with five ounce baseball, rotational patterning, and still strength training is at the far right. But what do we do to fill in the cracks? Well, historically, we, we train speed strength, you know, with, with rotational stuff, um, with weighted balls, um, you know, and then strength speed would be medicine balls, maybe four to eight pound rotational stuff. Not a ton of resistance, but we can't load them like crazy because the, again, the, the impact of gravity is up and down and we need to produce force against resistance rotationally. And this is where Proteus is, is really helpful. You can train it at speed strength, lighter loads moving faster. You can train it at strength speed, heavier loads moving a little bit slower. Um, you also have options, things like the VersaPulley for you know, overloading the eccentric portion of it. Where I really like Proteus is we can train it incredibly frequently because it's predominantly concentric resistance. So it doesn't make athletes really sore. And, and just like medicine ball stuff, I'm always surprised at how much we can train athletes without it you know, beating up on the joints.
So what does the research tell us? It shows that training rotation is, is better than just lifting and playing your sport. So David Szymanski um, has done some tremendous research for the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research over the years. And this is all the way back in 2007. They did a 12-week study of high school baseball players, average 15 years of age, so obviously not a heavily trained population. One group lifted and hit, and the other group lifted, hit, and did a three times a week med ball program. And when they looked at group two, which did all three, they found greater improvements in angular hip and shoulder velocities, bat end velocity, dominant and non-dominant torso rotational strength, and medicine ball hitters throw than group one. So really this is a signal that we have to train at these different points on the continuum. All the way to the left is the hitting, all the way to the right is the lifting. The med ball program basically slid in as your speed strength slash strength speed stuff right in the middle to really capitalize at all these important points along that absolute speed, absolute strength continuum. And I would argue that they probably developed a lot of uh, elasticity from both contractile elements and non-contractile elements. So, you know, the fascial system is working in conjunction with the muscle and, and tendons. So with that said, we're gonna jump ahead and start talking about um, how we take this information and apply it to some of our Proteus power reports. I think the best way for us to learn how to interpret a Proteus uh, slash CSP power report is to take someone who's very middle of the road, kind of your ideal athlete, and break it out section by section and answer some of the questions we want. So when we're looking at the top of this report, we're looking at overall balance and overall percentile. So I think these tell us a little bit about the athlete in the big picture, and similar to what we would do with a functional movement screen where you might find a score of a 17 out of 21, tells you the athlete's globally a pretty good mover, but you definitely want to dig in deeper to see if there's a really bad straight leg raise or a brutal overhead squat, something along those lines. So we want to look big picture, and then we want to break it out um, by some individual entities. So this particular athlete's a 6'3", 225-pound college baseball player at the time of this test, actually was drafted thereafter, so now is playing professional baseball, pitched at 92 to 94, would, would touch 95 to 96 miles per hour as well. So we look at his overall percentile ranked to the top right here. We see the power and the acceleration profile are, are pretty comparable. So um, they're, they're obviously at a higher percentile, so he tests well for where he is. Um, but we don't see this dramatic difference between power and acceleration. Okay, so what acceleration really is, is it's how quickly you get to your peak power. So in the grand scheme of things, typically acceleration is going to increase as power increases, but that's not always the case. So you may see subtle um, differences here. We know in the world of baseball, it's not just about being powerful, it's about applying power at the right times. So for a pitcher, obviously, that's going to be acceleration after front foot strike. So big gaps between the two of these are going to tell you that maybe you need to change where you're at on this, this force velocity curve. So if we see someone with high power numbers and lower acceleration numbers, I'm probably going to train with less resistance and you know more velocity. Um, you know, conversely, if we see him very, very similar like we do with this athlete, we're probably going to train everything. This athlete needs to push his force profile higher by getting stronger and continuing to train kind of some of these reactive components. Um, if we look at overall balance, there's about a 4.5% difference between sides and power, something that's totally within normal range. Um, you know, I, I generally only get a red flag when that's, you know, 10 or 15% uh, difference between the two. And then acceleration, you typically will see better acceleration on a dominant side. So on this one, one, I'm probably not as concerned if it's below 20% difference um, just because athletes are more efficient with respect to developing their peak power quickly on a dominant side. Um, as we scroll a little further, we break this out by upper body, core, and lower body. Um, so the upper body gives you, you know, a, both a, you know, a, a general perspective on how they work in that region of their body, but I also like to look at it as a way to assess whether we have athletes who may have you know, hefty differences between sides in, in arm strength. So if we see someone who, you know, tests really, really poorly on their dominant side compared to their non-dominant side, that's going to be concerning for me. So I look at D2 extension and flexion. So if I see that, you know, his left side, which was his non-dominant side, you know, is, is substantially lower than his right side, it's not nearly as concerning as if I see the opposite where his dominant side is, is really poor. So he tested the 80th percentile on his right side for extension and 88th percentile on his right side for flexion. So he's he's looking pretty good. And you go to the left side, 68 for extension and 92 for flexion. Um, not really a surprise there just because extension is something that gets trained really, really hard during the acceleration phase of throwing. So I would expect him 
uh, to be substantially better on his throwing side. So just look for, for giant differences between the two. You'll also get some acceleration numbers. I don't necessarily concern myself as much with upper body acceleration um, as I do with some of the stuff we see further down. So as we scroll down, we're looking at core power. This for me, if I can only look at one individual test on a, um, a given power report, I'm probably going right to this uh, plyo straight arm trunk rotation versus straight arm rotation without the counter. So when we talk about counter versus non-counter, all we're looking at is how well does this athlete use elasticity to create power, right? So you'll see some athletes that really muscle up and move things um, and they'll be really proficient on a non-counter versus athletes who are really elastic, they'll blow the things out of the water on the counter. So what we wanna see in typical athletes is a 10 to 20% greater um, counter movement. So in other words, they should be better on the plyo trunk rotation. And you look at him, he's right in that, that range. Um, he's 11% higher in his counter. And my experience has been that athletes actually test a little bit better on this with each subsequent test as they get a little bit more familiar with how to you know, rapidly transition, but it's also a function of how we train them. So big red flags for me is if I see an athlete who's substantially higher on his counter than he is on his non-counter, that tells me that's a, an athlete who's strong and not very elastic. Um, so something you definitely wanna keep an eye out for. And then lastly, you head down here, you can look at lower body power and acceleration, just checking to see if you see substantial differences, unilateral versus bilateral. And again, as you work your way through, you're gonna get these overall percentile ranks, which tend to be really, really good when we're talking to middle school, high school kids that may be testing on this, and we can put them alongside our more advanced college and pro athletes, just to give them a frame of reference for where they stand from a percentile rank, how they push these general athleticism numbers up so that they can enhance um, some specific sport disciplines. So um, just gives you a feel for what a typical power report is. So start by looking at overall balance, overall percentile rank, and then start to break down the individual test, look at counter versus non-counter. So we're trying to decide is an athlete strong, is an athlete weak slash slow, is an athlete elastic, and is that athlete asymmetrical. Now that we've had a chance to look at how to interpret a power report, report in a general sense, we're gonna look at some specific breakout ones on unique cases. And they aren't necessarily unique, but they represent different extremes that we have to appreciate. So this first athlete we're gonna show you is an older athlete who's got quite a bit of, of major league time, but just honestly needs to get back to the basics of training strength and in turn power. What we see is his overall percentile rank for power is 64th and his acceleration profile is 58th percentile. So what that means is we have an athlete who just isn't strong enough and this is especially magnified because you have to appreciate that the sample size upon which these percentiles are based is actually large enough that it includes high school college players as well so for this athlete to be playing in the big leagues um, you know at such a low percentile this is why a lot of his velocity is probably falling off he's just not putting enough force into the ground and you know using it to actually transfer to the baseball um, and you can see things that reflect this in, in certain ways one of the things we look at is his d2 extension slash flexion 40th to 61st percentile on his dominant arm. I look at this athlete as a little bit of a, a high risk to have some kind of an arm injury based on how those strength numbers test because we do know that rotator cuff strength is one of the few things that almost always predicts injuries um, in baseball players. You know, relatively symmetrical side to side, so not something that freaks me out in that context, just globally weak. When we go back and we look at this athlete, 9% higher non-counter, so he's not elastic either. So it's a low number, and it's not something that, that taps into the elastic um, you know, kind of components of things. So one of the things that we see with a lot of athletes as they age is that power falls off quickly. I would argue this athlete needs to build some strength and then train some power uh, to, to really get where he needs to be. Now, if we go to a next example, we're actually gonna to go to the absolute other end of the spectrum, and we're gonna take an athlete who's really strong. Um, so this kid is a 100 mile per hour arm, big old six foot eight, 250 pound athlete who moves some serious weight. As a, as a frame of reference, the first day he walked into a weight room, I saw him do a split squat with a front squat grip for 300, for, with 315 pounds for six reps per side. So moves some big boy weights, and also has the power production to accommodate it. When we look at him, he's got a pretty substantial difference in power side to side, 23%. Like I said, when I start seeing these numbers be up in the 20s, it gets me a little bit more concerning. Interestingly, for those 
of you who are familiar with the, the Posture Restoration Institute, he's one of the more extreme left AIC, right BC patterns I've seen. Very low right shoulder, very adducted right hip. So he's someone who is definitely asymmetrical um, in the way that he moves and gets in and out of, of one hip versus the other. Um, interestingly, the acceleration on his right side is not as extremely different as I would expect it to be on his left. So I think the upside for this athlete in particular, um, especially because his acceleration at 80th percentile is lower than his 94th percentile power, is probably going to be to train at a lower point on that force velocity curve. So use lighter weights and focus on moving them really quickly. I think it will help him. Um, one of the things I think is also intriguing is how this athlete might respond to some kind of an intervention with some some PRI driven hip shifting drills, things to to basically get him into that left hip and out of the right one prior to testing. I think we'd actually see a little bit of a change in in the power dynamic in terms of balance, just because we could probably get him back to a more neutral alignment from which to um, you know apply force. We look at it more specifically, upper body 96th and 97th percentile, core 98th percentile, lower body 82nd percentile, probably a lot stronger than that, but does have a history of some low back issues that probably make it harder for him to test well on some of these lower body tests, especially being a big guy. So I don't place a whole lot of faith in that particular number. But when we come back and we look at this counter versus non-counter, he's 2% higher on his non-counter. So this tells me this is an athlete who is strong and when I take that and I put it alongside his slightly lower acceleration numbers, it tells me that he's got to get to you know, the velocity end of that force velocity curve. We've got to take the loads, make them lighter, and move them really faster um, to the point that he's up you know, in the 10 to 20% range on his counter movement being higher than his non-counter movement. So in general, we just want to make him more elastic, both via you know, the musculotendon units, but also via that fascial system. And I think you'd find that in the process, he'd probably become more symmetrical just because it's more athletic movements. And then last but not least, I want to show you a little bit of a unique scenario. We don't see these nearly as much. This is an elastic athlete, um, so it doesn't have a big difference um, in terms of power or acceleration side to side, but does have a big difference between power and acceleration. So he's 76 percentile, which is pretty good um, in terms of power, and you know a little bit lower in acceleration. So this could be due to a few things. Some some athletes are just learning the test, so I would definitely want to retest him and see if his acceleration proves on subsequent ones as he gets more accustomed to the pattern relatively symmetrical side to side um, with his upper body, you know, particularly the arm care and the press and the row stuff. So no big concerns there. But as we work our way down just a little bit, we look at the core. This is the one that jumps out at me big time. We look at his plyo straight arm trunk rotation versus his non-counter straight arm trunk rotation. He tests a ton better with the counter, 22% higher. So that's one of the better numbers that you'll really see. Like I said, the standard's gonna be 10 to 20%. So what I'm thinking for this athlete is that we we you know we, we really know how to use the elastic components of things. So I'm probably, when I first look at him, I'm gonna spend some time getting him stronger, trying to push that power number up. And typically when power goes up, acceleration is gonna go up as well. But what we might have to do is if we push this up and you know he gets up to 85% on his power percentile and this thing doesn't come along for the ride, there actually may be a dynamic where we need to make him more comfortable training at a lower force um, and a higher velocity. Maybe he's guarding, maybe there's something like that that um, is just limiting his numbers. But right now, it makes us think that he's very elastic um, just because he has a pretty good power percentile um, but he still has a, a really, really high uh, counter movement. So a little bit of a tricky one where you could go in two different directions. Do you either make him stronger um, and just push heavier weights, or do you train at a, at a lower point on the, on the force velocity curve with, with less load and moving it faster? Um, I don't think the correct solution with this athlete is to go right to strength speed stuff where it's a, a heavier load that you're trying to move you know, reasonably fast. Um, so a little bit of a see how it goes. I would definitely retest this athlete and see if a subsequent test brings his acceleration numbers closer to what he has from a power standpoint. It wouldn't surprise me at all if he tests a little bit differently. And if that's the case, um, you know it's definitely in a scenario where you just got to get him stronger and push those numbers up higher because his counter um, movements are really, really good. This will be in a more abbreviated description, but it is an important one to consider. 
this is an athlete who is actually very asymmetrical. So when we look at his power report, certainly we see some differences in power between right and left. Um, we'll also see some power versus acceleration differences that we saw in our elastic athlete. But what I think is, is really critically important is that this is a great example of an athlete in the upper body that tests dramatically different. So typically when we see right-handed individuals as this guy is, we will see them test a little bit better on their right side than their left. Um, so we're looking more at like you know the overall percentile ranks. Do they have strong cuffs slash scapular stabilizers? But we, we also want to be cognizant of is how much stronger is it than the left side. So look at this athlete on D2 extension, 54th percentile right, 14th percentile left, 76th percentile for flexion, 21st percentile on, um, on flexion. Excuse me. So when we look at this athlete, what we actually realize is he had a left shoulder subluxation previously. So right-handed pitcher who had had a recent shoulder subluxation and it was something that was obviously impacting this. So as part of his training program, we need to make sure that we get some better stability um, on his left side. And you'll actually see if you work through the entire test that there are places where this also uh, shows up in, in other capacities. Um, interestingly, he actually did pretty well on his full body power test. It wasn't totally off, but when he did his left side 79th percentile on the shot put test versus 88th percentile on the right. So. Um, you know, we'd expect him to, to be pretty close between the two of those, but that left shoulder clearly was, was a little bit of an eliminating factor. So we can have all the best power numbers in the world from a lower body and a core standpoint, but if we have one joint in the upper extremity that's a limiting factor, um, you can also, it, can, it can definitely impact our overall percentile ranks and how well we perform. So perfect example of how you don't want to just look at the numbers at the top, but you want to break things out individually, um, piece by piece to see if there's, you know, an asymmetry or some kind of an injury that, you know, just hasn't been fully rehabilitated. So that should give you a little insights into how we interpret some of these unique cases. Again, um, you know, the, the benefits of Proteus aren't just with respect to, you know, being a good training implement that you can use as a speed strength or a strength speed, but they're also obviously great because you can use it as an assessment tool to basically dictate the direction of your training.